Joko Widodo is famous for a lot of things, as the Indonesian leader who led several reforms, as one of Southeast Asia's most ambitious leaders, and even as a politician who may eventually become the most famous Indonesian president to ever live in history. The cusp of what most people attribute him for, however, is his transformative goals. He reformed several sectors in Indonesia. From its economic stance to its social stance, he made several changes within the government, which affected the entire country. Throughout the years he had been in office, international think tanks, local lawmakers, and professional institutions have made his reformative decisions over and over again. These reforms, after all, have already seen an immediate impact on the economy. Indonesia, in simpler words, has been transformed by the man himself, Joko Widodo. But the real question lies not in what we can see at a very basic level, but rather in the specific side of things. Just how much has Jokowi changed Indonesia? Is there a quantitative measurement to understand how many changes he has led? These are the most important factors that we need to understand about Joko Widodo. In discussing these, we have sought to divide them into a few categories and showcase what are the largest reforms published in each sector. These include social service reforms, economic reforms, and the most important reforms that have driven the country's biggest change, which is foreign relations. These three are arguably among the most important factors that occurred under Joko Widodo, but they do not likewise constitute the entire cusp of his presidency. When we talk about Joko Widodo's economic reforms, there is often a lot to discuss. Jokowi's presidency, after all, has been stretched far beyond since 2014. But on the day of his campaigning, one of his promises to the economy of Indonesia has been to push the economy's growth rate above 7% a year, one that was little seen in the country and rather a bold statement to be made. Yet this very ambitiousness of his may have been overdone, as it was never achieved. Some might denounce his failure to push the country's economy to 7% due to incompetence, but it should rather be because it was just too optimistic. And of course, we have also seen unprecedented havoc led by COVID-19. But either his economic agenda was achieved or not, what we have still seen is stability across the Indonesian archipelago. His team maintained the economic growth felt in the past administrations. This has then led to the Indonesian economy to continue growing modestly. But in understanding more about specific policies, we can first go to an important paper published by the Center of Administrative Studies in May 2020, titled Business and Bureaucracy. This report stated that there was a period of reform of good governance during the previous administration and continued until the Jokowi era. The article claimed that this practice of good governance has influenced the economic growth of Indonesia to continue. The paper has also stated that Jokowi has pushed national economic growth and stabilized the macro economy by increasing three main public infrastructure programs, namely information and communication, transportation and warehousing, and construction development. The paper stated, in other words, that Jokowi's era has all but continued the practice of good governance and pushed investments in infrastructure programs. This may then suggest the continued economic building laid out in the previous administration. On the other hand, there too is another study, one that was published by the Journal of Southeast Asian Economies in 2018, which stated that the economic reform packages led by Jokowi were to remove bureaucratic obstacles for private investors. Deregulation and debureaucratization of the economy have been central to Jokowi's reform agendas and, as the paper said, have accomplished notable results. Other than economic reforms, there are also notable social services reforms that Jokowi has done. According to the same Journal of Southeast Asian Economies, a significant social service reform was an assistance program enacted by Jokowi. These assistance programs have given access to education and health services, as well as food and cash transfers, and grants for villages as mandated by the village law. These poor and inequality reduction programs would often be applauded by the citizens of Indonesia. However, the paper cited that it was unfortunately not sufficient enough to help the poor. More work needs to be done. Finally, a more significant feat is when he introduced the Smart Indonesian Card and Indonesian Health Card. These two major social assistance programs in the area of education and health have helped increase the coverage of these programs. The Indonesian Smart Card, for instance, has led to the coverage of over 19.7 million students by 2016. 
a massive increase from just 11.2 million in 2014. But then again, if we dive deep into scholarly journals, there are a number of studies refuting Jokowi's reforms for the poor. A paper in 2018 stated that welfare improvement is higher than for the poorest and richest population groups. And the study has further stated that in the first three years of its administration saw that the poor were less connected to the economic growth compared to the middle class and the rich. These specific social reforms can likewise suggest that it was not perfectly executed and proved to be very fruitful for the social reforms aspired. But it is also possible that more work needs to be done on the side of academic studies, as benefits from said programs can be distinguished not from their short-term value, but their long-term value. Finally, the most important factor in Jokowi's administration tenure is his foreign policy. Why? Because it was under his administration that led the entrance of more Chinese involvement, whether it be politically or economically. We will get back to that a bit later. For now, what we can discuss is what a certain journal cites as the pro-people foreign policy, which according to a Central European Journal of International and Security Studies states, quote, Joko Widodo wants his government's foreign policy to benefit the people and put forward in the field of diplomacy by paying attention to the needs of the people overseas." End quote. Pro-people foreign policy, in other words, as the article stated, were the manifested programs at the foreign ministry. And the purpose of this is to protect the people in accordance with national ideas in maintaining the welfare of the people at home and abroad. Therefore, we can then go back to China and see why this pro-people foreign policy works in correlation. Or rather, we can at the very least connect it to the entire general sense of Jokowi's investment strategies. Jokowi has implemented various reforms in both its economic and foreign policies, which supported foreign investors in pushing investments over to Indonesia. The country has then posted record-breaking foreign investment figures. There are, however, other cited factors that have led to several oppositions. The administration has published a path towards greater protectionism. In recent years, Indonesia has passed new laws on mining, farming, and horticulture that restrict trade and increase local content rules for a range of products. This rise of resource nationalism has generated tensions since the bulk of U.S. foreign direct investment is in the oil, gas, and mining sectors. Finally, these three sectors, namely social, economic, and foreign policies, are likewise not the only factors that were changed throughout his administration. There was a lot, but most of the emphasis needed here was arguably in the economic agenda, and to only name a few policies supported. There was nothing more extraordinary than Jokowi's reforms for pushing investments and public infrastructure spending. The banning of raw materials was a key part of his push for foreign investments, whereas the increase in infrastructure spending was also a key part. The PwC stated that the total government infrastructure spending in Indonesia increased substantially by at least 51%, from 11.7 billion US dollars in 2014 to 15.5 billion dollars in 2015. These also increased further on. In 2023, infrastructure spending is now expected to range between 25.1 to 28.5 billion dollars. That also means that since Jokowi took office in 2014, infrastructure spending almost tripled. We can even see a relationship between infrastructure spending, foreign investments, and an increase in social service spending. Investors' confidence, after all, is more likely to increase whenever a government caters to its citizens through better services but also through public works, which can make efficiency better in the cases of logistics and even energy. Likewise, an increase in spending on infrastructure can also help the economy by alleviating poverty and improving education and healthcare. Let this topic, however, not dismiss that while Joko Widodo has become a very reformist person in the eyes of Indonesians, he has also been at times under scrutiny and controversies. We will, however, leave that for a different video. But anyway, Joko Widodo has arguably been one of the most unfathomable presidents Indonesia has ever had so far. He changed Indonesia in a lot of ways. Let us know what you think. Do you think Joko Widodo has changed Indonesia for the better? If so, in what way? Thanks for watching.